I've changed ads from losers to winners by changing one word in a headline. It is that powerful when you start doing it. Be that guy. They want to read who they're going to get a kick out. Hey, podcast listener. You're about to discover insider tips, tricks, and secrets to making more sales and converting more prospects into customers with email marketing. For more information about the Email Marketing Podcast or the Autoresponder Guy, go to dropdeadcopy.com slash podcast. Hey, uh, it's Johnny McIntyre here, the Autoresponder Guy, and it's time for episode 35 of the McMethod Email Marketing Podcast, where you'll discover how to increase your email profits by 25 to 100% in 90 days or less without spending more on advertising. Today, I'll be talking to a very, very famous copywriter called John Carlton. He's a guy you've probably heard of. John is one of the top copywriters in the world, if not the top copywriter. He kept company with the late Gary Albert, and he's the expert that the experts go to for marketing help. So this could be Rick Sheffern, Eben Pagan, Frank Gern, or someone in the big leagues. And today, John Carlton is going to share six leverage points of powerful, profitable email marketing and how you can apply his hard-won lessons with decades of experience about what it takes to really make sales with the words, whether via email or via sales copy or any other form of advertising to your own business and to your own email marketing campaign. So this is going to be a fantastic episode. There are a ton of golden nuggets, golden nuggets that can make you a lot of money in this episode. So I really hope you enjoy it. To get the show notes for this episode of the Email Marketing Podcast, go to themcmethod.com slash 35. Before we get into the interview, I have another five-star review to read out. This one is from Cubicle Free from Canada. It's five stars. It says, email marketing is where it is at. John is where email marketing is. I've had a thriving online business for over 10 years, but only recently focused on email marketing, and I found it was not as easy as many will make out. Since listening and applying John's methods over the past few months, I've seen conversions increase significantly. Great stuff. Thank you for the review, Mr. Cubicle Free. If you want to leave a review, you're going to have to jump over to iTunes, search for the Email Marketing Podcast or the McMethod Email Marketing Podcast. Use some of the clunky iTunes buttons and interface to go and leave a review. If you do leave me a review, you'll make my day. You'll put a huge smile on my face and I'll read your review out on the show, which uh, will kind of make you famous or a little bit famous anyway. Now, one last thing. I have a listener question that is an interesting question and you'll see what I mean in a minute. Here it is. How can I become more interesting to my readers? I'll tell you. But first, I just want to point out that it's the cardinal rule of marketing is don't be boring, right? You can tell the best how-to tips in the world, but if you're boring people, they're not going to pay attention, right? Everyone's been to a conference where there is a speaker who he might be incredibly knowledgeable. In fact, he might be the most knowledgeable guy at that conference. But when he gets up onto the stage, he opens up his PowerPoint presentation. You see it fire up on the screen behind him, and it's a boring-ass black page with a couple of words on it. And then he starts talking. He starts talking like this in a monotone. He doesn't have much expression, and he's certainly not very energetic. He might stand in one place on the stage. And so what happens is he's going through, doing this presentation, and you're just nodding off to sleep. And the slides do not help, right? Because every slide is packed with words. He's got, you know, slide number two has got five bullet points, facts and statistics that are really just boring. And then he's got another page and another slide and another page and another slide, and it's just putting everyone to sleep. Now, he might have the recipe for turning you know, metal into gold. Uh, he might have the greatest, the most valuable information in the world. But if he's boring people, if he's just a boring ass dude or lady, no one's going to pay attention. right? And that means that that value is going to be lost. So this is a great question. How can I become more interesting to my readers? Because when you are more interesting to your readers, to your subscribers, to the marketplace, you're going to capture more of their valuable attention. And remember, we live in an attention-based economy. Attention is one of the, the most valuable things that you can have these days, you're going to get more of their attention. It's going to be extremely, extremely rapt attention. So then you can start solving their problems and make a lot of money in the process. So how do you do it? Well, let's go back to that conference example. Think back to the last conference you went to and think about the different types of speakers. I bet you that there was a really, really good speaker there. There always is. There's always someone who's just fantastic on stage. And maybe you walked away from their talk and you weren't too sure about exactly what you learned. Maybe they didn't give you too much actionable information. But you paid attention. You listened to them. When they were on the stage, you were staring down at them, right? You had a blast, right? And what these people do, what these speakers, what these communicators do to be that good is they tell stories. 
Now, this is, I've spoken about this so many times on this podcast. If you've listened to the other episodes, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's about telling stories. This is the secret to effective marketing, and it's becoming more and more so, you know, as the years go by. This is what Gary Vaynerchuk raves about. This is what all the top marketers are using to sell their products. Frank Kern does this. It's all about stories, right? And it's far easier than you think to create stories. You can take anything, whether it's a cup of coffee that's right next to you as you listen to this podcast in your office. It could be a story about how you're driving to work and there's lots of traffic. It could be a story about how your daughter got a box of Lego for Christmas and it took her only 20 minutes to put together something that takes most kids two hours because you helped her out because you were her coach. And therefore, that's why people should sign up to your coaching program because coaches are fantastic, okay? They really help you get results. So you can take anything and make it a story. Here, I'll give you four examples real quick and then we'll get into this interview with John Carlton. Example number one. So this is going to be about email marketing. I have an email about Abraham Lincoln's story. It's failure, 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 failure success. It's a great story. It's all about persistence. So I tell a story at the end of the email. I just say, if you want to kind of cut this learning curve in half, avoid some of these failures, get the McIntyre method. Right? So I've told a story, transitioned into the pitch. Example number two, I wrote an email which is basically about Eminem, one of Eminem's songs, which is pretty much what, you know, Eminem singing, rapping about, you know, what if I'd been a bitch? What if I'd given up? What if I'd gone out and played with friends too much instead of working on my rap skills? And then at the end of it, I'm like, if you want to take advantage of the chance that you have right now at the start of 2014 to kick some ass, then sign up to my VIP coaching program. Example number three was open rates don't matter. I tell a story basically about how everyone thinks open rates matter when it comes to email clicks as well. And then I talk about a conversation I had with someone special, an expert, who told me that open rates don't matter for a damn. The only thing that really matters is... You can find out when you get the McIntyre method, right? So I told a story about open rates and a conversation I had and then transitioned into a pitch. Example number four, <laughs> this is actually one of my top converting emails. The subject line is, boom, shaka, laka, taka, tuku, boo, something along those lines. It's the most random thing ever and all I'm trying to illustrate with people is that subject lines aren't as important as they think. What's more important is, well, you're going to have to read that email, and then it leads naturally into the pitch. I've written emails about a you know, story how I almost got arrested over here in Thailand, done examples with people, and I've picked something on a table like a glass, talked about the craftsmanship, and then talked about how my product will help you become a real craftsman when it comes to creating products. You can do this with anything and everything, and when you start doing this, you're going to see incredible results. That is how to be interesting to your readers, to your subscribers, okay? And that's how to make a lot of money, and it's going to become more and more important it's the linchpin skill, I believe, in 2014 and onwards, is being a great, great storyteller and being able to captivate people's attention with that. Now, that's enough of that. I've spoken way too fast, way too many words. I hope that's been helpful. Let's go get into this interview now with Mr. John Carlton. It's John McIntyre here, the order is funny guy. I'm here with very special guest, Mr. John Carlton, a man who probably needs no introduction on a marketing podcast like this, but I'm going to give him a quick intro anyway before we get into it, because uh, he's got a really great, uh, really great first name. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say that, man. So John Carlton slightly refers to himself as the most ripped off writer on the web. Other marketers call John the most respected writing teacher alive. There's a long list of well-known marketers who freely reference John as their primary mentor for writing sales messages. Rick Sheffron personally bought his entire staff copies of John's writing course. I think that's awesome. Evan Pagan specifically refers to John's teaching whenever he discusses copywriting with his clients. Frank Kern freely admits that John's direct advice helped him have the most lucrative one-day launch in the history of the internet. So uh, he's got some really interesting stuff to say on copywriting and how to get response, whether it's with email or sales letters or anything that has to do with a sales message. So it's going to be a good interview. John, how are you going today? I'm doing fine, John. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm just waking up. I've got some uh, coffee next to me with some butter and coconut oil of all things in there. You ever heard of uh, you're doing coffee? bulletproof? I am. It's uh, I'm doing this keto diet, this weird ass diet where I don't eat any carbs, so I need to eat a lot of fat. So I've got 500 calories of fat in this coffee. <laughs> Well, I hope you make it through the interview without your head exploding. So. I think uh, I'll, I'll see how I go. All right, let's get into it, man. Um, before we talk about the, the points that you've got written down there, give us a quick background on, on who you are and what you do. I'm in year 30 of my career. I, I got started late. I have a classic, we call it origin story. I was about 32 years old and going nowhere. I was an original slacker. And then I kind of had an epiphany that if anything was going to happen good in my life, I was going to have to be the man in charge of making it happen because there was going to be no white knight arriving. There were going to be no opportunities landing in my lap that were going to you know make things happen for me. I had to make everything happen. So I started out as a career as a freelance copywriter and just by a 
applying all the principles of having good goals, going after the goals, making them happen, and kept pushing and uh, jumping on every single opportunity I had. I was able to mentor with the, some of the Hall of Famers around, like uh, Jay Abraham and uh, Gary Halbert, uh, Jim Rutz, a lot of the great copywriters, the great guys in advertising. So I had a wonderful first 10 or 15 years. And then I started dabbling around with other stuff and doing my own things. And around well, a little over 10 years ago, I decided to come out as a guru because I realized that in my career, rising from literally being homeless, sleeping on a friend's couch, I had lost my girlfriend, my job and my place to live all within a two month period. And I was living out of my car when I had this epiphany and I was broke and I was a slacker. Rising from that, I went into the advertising business, made every single mistake that is possible to make. And I kept notes and I went and I fixed it and I made it better and I did better the next time. And I just kept applying that process of blunder ahead, make the mistake, fix it, and then remember how I fixed it. And so by the time, you know, 25 years had passed, I was in a position to be a guru, to be able to say, I've been there, done that. You know, I spent my entire career on the front lines of advertising, seeing how things were done. I, I was behind the scenes on a lot of things. I was involved in a lot of the changes in advertising. And when the web came along as a viable marketing vehicle, I was right there. I just made a smooth transfer over to it. And a lot of the guys now really killing it online used my book, uh, Kick-Ass Copywriting Secrets of a Marketing Rebel, which was actually originally written more or less about direct mail copy, but it didn't matter because it's a, it was direct response mm. advertising. And so they used that. That's like uh, Rich Sheffern was one of the first guys to use what I was talking about, just making good copy, just having that sales oriented persuasive conversation with your prospect that flips them and it doesn't matter what the vehicle is whether it's online face to face mail radio tv video it it doesn't matter how you deliver it it's the basic sales message is what i've always been about and i'm very old school i haven't really invented anything i've more refined the classic salesmanship that has been around since the dawn of time and all great salesmen come back to the fundamentals and th so that's what I am I'm kind of a guy who loves the fundamentals the basics and I like to speak from experience you know there's no theory when when you get uh, info from me it's I've tried it and I've either got my nose bloodied by it and then figured it out or I accidentally hit it right off the bat that okay. doesn't happen very often though John okay John so you focus specifically on teaching people how to write but I'm sure that you'd be able to talk about the entire thing from writing to yes. strategy to positioning to all that stuff. Well, John, it's it's interesting you say that because I have mentored a ton of people who wanted to become direct response freelance copywriters. And it was high-end, high-paid copywriters. To be that high-end copywriter, not just a guy that walks in and writes what you, the client, wants, but rather the writer that walks in and tells the client, here's what you need. You have to understand all forms of marketing. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to be the adult in the room and say, here's how you should do it. Here's why you should do it. Here are alternatives you can use. Here are different paths you can take. Here's how your business plan should read. And you become very conversant in things like the back end and what to do in marketing that will hinge on the copy. Every Everything starts and ends with the copy, but you still need a good business plan. You need to be able to find prospects. You need to be able to communicate with them in an easy way. You need to be able to take orders. You need to understand what your competition's doing and what other sharks are swimming in the pond you're swimming in and all this stuff. So yes, you become a overall marketing consultant. And in fact, that's probably a better term for me to use is kind of a uber marketing consultant, a guy who knows all things about business from getting the business plan down to working through every single problem an entrepreneur is going to have along the way. Well, let's get into these. Uh, you said you had six points. Now, I'm guessing these six points are on email marketing specifically, right? Yeah, you asked me to talk about email marketing. I wrote some of the first marketing emails only because I was involved with the web from the very beginning. I just had a lot of friends who were geeks. And what exploded on the web, of course, as anybody who pays attention to semi-recent history, was right up until around 2001, 2002, it was hard to get merchant accounts. It was hard to process orders. PayPal was a huge game changer there. But also, I realized probably 2002 or so, when my 85-year-old father, 
father told me he was now buying his prescriptions online from New Zealand using his credit card, I knew something had flipped in society and suddenly it was okay to buy things online and the web just took off from there. That was like the starting gun going off for marketers. Before then, it was savvy marketers, but dealing on online and there was certainly an online presence back when AOL was the main way people were getting email, but it, it hadn't coalesced into a major vehicle for entrepreneurs. And once it did, things like getting your website up and making it work, sales funnels that work. This is before terms like pop-up windows were around and, and exit windows and all of the stuff was, was just being formed. So it all depended on how you approached the prospect. When a prospect came into your world online, how were you going to deal with it? And one of the most fundamental ways of dealing with it was to get their email address and then start a conversation with them by email. Okay. And my first point, just to get it out of the way, John, which you probably already established with everybody, but it's worth repeating. When you get someone's email into your world, not when you're uh, writing emails that an affiliate will send out and you're actually not going to get the name back, you either get the sale or you won't. But when you are gathering names for your list, make sure you don't get the burn emails. Almost everybody now has an email that they only use when they sign up for stuff and they seldom check it and it's not on their radar very often and it's usually full of, of spam and they just don't don't pay much attention to it. Mine's on AOL. I've had it for, I don't know, 20 years now and I seldom check it, but when I sign up, I usually use that email. The way to get around that, of course, I'm, I'm sure guys like you like Shrackmo and others that you've interviewed have talked about this. Make sure that the transaction that you have initially is going to be something where they need to check that email where that email becomes a essential part of the conversation that you're about to have, the relationship you're about to have. So you can just ask them at a very basic level, please use your real email when you check every day. I promise not to spam you. I'm not going to overwhelm you with stuff, but it's very important that you get my first emails because blank, and then you go on. And then it's up to you to make sure that you follow up on that promise. That's one of the first promises is you're not going to make them regret giving you their, their main email. And in fact, you're going to become one of those emails that appears in the inbox where the response is, eh, should I junk this? Or, you know, do I have to look at this? But rather, wow, let's see what this guy has to say now. Okay. So the really interesting thing there is, it sounds like when you give away an ebook or when you give away something that someone just has to enter their email address, you're going to get people who are just dropping this burn email in just to see what's on the other side. Whereas yeah. when you have a course, I mean, I do daily emails, so you're going to get, you sign up, you're going to get emails Monday to Friday for the next three months. That means that they can't use these burn email because if they want the emails, they have to be checking them and opening them regularly. Right. It's worth acknowledging to yourself, why have you done this? I mean, even if you get the main email, you can always get unsubscribed really fast if you don't fulfill the basic promise that you've made. So it's up to you to make each email, to spend time on the email, to understand that email is as important as every phone call you make to your girlfriend <laughs> or or your spouse or your boss. That's like, or whoever. That's like dating, isn't it? Sending an email. It, is oh, very it's much very like much like dating. And if you think you can get away with one text to your new girlfriend that is flippant and she doesn't understand you're being sarcastic and takes it seriously, you can cause all kinds of problems. So you're, you're careful. You edit, you don't write and send, you, you sit on it for however long you have. Have, and you think about it and you run it through every kind of different path in your own head from your own experience of you receiving emails from people. You know, how is this going to be received? Does it fulfill the basic promise of what this person is thinking he got involved with when they signed up with you? How are you proceeding with this? And it's very important. It's a relationship. Okay, so we've got the burn email. That's point number one. What's yeah. point number two? conversations. There's been a long running battle whether email should be short or long or whatever. And I say that's irrelevant. It depends very much on the market you have. Some markets only respond to short emails. Guys are sending out videos, you know, via email now. There's all kinds of things going on. So you got to get hip to what your market already responds to well. And then you have to fit that in with whatever you're doing. However, I've sent out really long emails that have been well received. And I've sent out very short emails that have been very well received. But the reason they're well received is because it's all part of the conversation. So if I keep it short and I keep it sizzling, it's kind of like, again, if you if you keep that relationship thing in mind, it's just, I'm touching base with you. I'm letting you know, blank, go over to this link, check it out. That's sometimes all you need. That ties in with the third thing that I want to talk about. This is what 
I firmly believe, I'm sure there are exceptions out there, but I firmly believe an email should have one goal. You shouldn't try to do any more than one thing in any given email. And if it's to click on a link to continue that conversation in a different format, either in a video sales letter or a long form sales page or whatever you want them to do, if you want them to sign up for something right there, just focus on one action in the email. Don't have tangents. Don't go off on anything. Make it very focused and very straightforward. But you need to be that one email that he gets today that isn't a drag, that isn't boring him, that isn't something he's even going to think twice about. Mm. And, of course, what that means is that you get into, you know, the third point I want to make is it's all dependent on the subject line. And I'm sure you've talked about this with other people a lot, but that subject line is a combination headline. It's a shout out. It's a tap on the shoulder from behind. It's everything you've ever done in face-to-face contact with somebody that gets them to stop being distracted or stop doing whatever else they were doing and Mm. give their total focus onto you. As I was mentioning before, John, as an old school copywriter, I cut my teeth on direct mail, which probably most of your listeners have no idea how direct mail even (laughs) operates. But it's basically, it was based on a sales letter inside an envelope. The envelope arrives in the mail and it's the job of the copywriter to get that envelope opened and that letter read. One of the problems is, I'm sure everybody has heard of the term junk mail. When you send out an advertisement or a pitch or something in the mail, if the recipient realizes it's junk, it often goes straight in the trash without being opened. Mm. To get around that, the savvy copywriter started writing what's called teaser copy on the outside of the envelope. And it wasn't copy that said, you know, free offer from Time Life for the entire World War II video series, where you can just decide right then, don't want that, boom, throw it away, don't even open it up. Rather, the teaser stuff was called teaser because it teased. It didn't give away any information. It did what we call blind copy, which meant that it either asked questions or it raised issues that to find out the answer, to get a resolution to what was brought up in the teaser copy, you had to open the envelope and read what was inside. Same thing exists with email. If you can get a subject line that tickles a hot point in your recipient's life and doesn't blend in with the background, so it kind of stands out, you're going to get them to open the email. So the only reason the subject line exists is to get them to get further into the copy. And if they're looking at a preview, they're going to look at the first couple of lines maybe. So maybe you can expand that. But usually it's kind of like Twitter. You know, you have a small amount of space there to get enough of a jolt to get them to open the email. So the one interesting thing here is that like if someone's on your list, maybe the first few emails that they get from you, they're going to be looking at that subject line. But once they know what you send out and it's quality and it's great stuff, they're going to start opening that email based on what's well, John Carlton's email, right? So what's going to be more important Possibly. is who's it's from, right? Possibly. I I would actually not rely on that as a marketer because for my money, and this comes from from old school direct response, which is direct mail and stuff, Mm. is every single time you have a contact with your prospect, you better deal with it taking nothing for granted. Make no assumptions that they like you, that they're going to open it because they like the last one, that they've given you any kind of extra attention in their life. Remember that even if they paid money, for whatever you're you're sending them. And the emails are coming. It's the fourth email in an eight email series. Smart marketers know you can't assume that they did anything on the third email mm-hmm. or that they read any of them. And a lot of people, especially when they get heavily involved, I've experienced this myself. They say, wow, I've, I've been waiting a long time to get involved with Susie Q's course on whatever. And she's going to send me five emails. And boy, this is going to be great. It's going to help me with my business. First email arrives from Susie Q with stage one of the course. You know, it can get put into a folder somewhere and you go, okay, you know, and then number two comes tomorrow and, I, and the guy is thinking, I'm going to get to this on Friday or next week or, you know, I'm going to open up some time. Mm-hmm. Pretty soon they're stacking up and he's way behind. So making the assumption that because he paid for it, because he's interested, because he responded to the first one, because of anything, I think you're making a big mistake. Make each email a little bit of an event. A tweak his brain. If you find there's a way that you can tweak them, I deal with guys a lot in the health and fitness field, for example. So you can't do cliche stuff. You can't say, here's another way to lose 50 pounds in, in an hour and a half. The nonsense detector in prospects' heads is is finely attuned to nonsense, mm. and they will not fall for any of the tricks that have been happening for a long time. They, they tend to be a little smart and uh, almost sophisticated, but you can use that to your advantage. Just find whatever 
the small thing that you can say that will get them excited about that particular email that day, that time. Treat each one as a sovereign instance in this relationship. And it has to be self-contained. So yes, where, yeah, they don't need to read the three emails before that to get what's in the fourth email. You can still reference it and say, so, you know, drop these little hints, goes back to this teasing idea, which you might make some tantalizing statement about an email that you've already sent them or about an email that's coming up. But as far as getting the message from that email, you have to be able to understand exactly what that email is about by not having not read any other email. And you have to understand why they would open any of your emails in the first place. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this has to do with your personality. In other words, the weird thing about the web, the thing that marketers are still struggling with, even, even really savvy marketers, is the wealth of alternate options available. If they signed up for your email course, they signed up to hear from you at all for any reason, whatever you got, you're probably not alone. And they know that there are other people in the market they can go to. They have other options. It, even guys like Tony Robbins, you know, he has a lot of competition. Mm. Uh, guys like Bill Phillips in the fitness industry, a lot of competition. People can just go online and find a wealth of other options to do. Mm. So one of the things that can put you ahead is If you can, install a little personality in there. And you will find a lot of the top marketers doing that. I've certainly done it a lot. Uh, Frank Kern, Gary Halbert did it. You establish yourself as someone who you would want to hang out with. And the emails reflect that. So when I say it's a conversational email, that also includes everything you might do in a face-to-face situation to stand out from the crowd, to be that guy in a crowded room that they would want to stop and talk with for a few minutes, that they would become interested in, that might make them laugh, might make them think twice about what they're doing, might actually give them some solid information sheathed in this fun or exciting or deeper, more interesting or titillating type of thing. If you're in politics, for example, and I don't know why you would be, but let's say you're you're emailing something about politics. You don't necessarily want to be funny, but you would employ a lot of the tactics that the classic uh, political email does, which is outrage. If you're dealing in marketing, you can talk to the cows come home about making more money in the fastest possible way, but that's a cliche now. So how you couch that? And in fact, I often come from the opposite, and I've had subject lines that work very well, which is how to completely ruin your business in an hour and a half or how to make the most common blunder that failed entrepreneurs make right before they commit suicide, something along that line. Uh, I actually haven't used the suicide line, but <laughs> but what I do use is something called power words. And John, if you've gotten any of my stuff, you may have gotten that special free report I have called power words. So I went through all of my previous ads and direct mail letters and online posts and newsletters and blogs and articles and everything I've written. And I pulled out the words that I was relying on to kind of startle people, to get their attention, to move them around. And it's usually a verb. Two of the main words that come up would be like murder and humiliate. So I will say, you know, how to murder your bottom line this year, how to humiliate your competition, things like that. Using these words sets you apart. If you look into what makes one person interesting when they're talking, say from the stage, in their writing, in their video sales letters, what makes them a little different is the choice of words, not 50 cent words that I'd have to go and look up, but common words used uncommonly or in a surprise situation yeah. or amping up the stuff so that you are taking full advantage of the language. Real quick, I will just use one example because these are usually verbs. You can say, I walked down the street. This is an example I use a lot. Yep. Or you can say, I floated down the street. I rushed down the street in a panic. I blew down the street. I trotted down the street. If you can always circle all of the verbs in your copy, in your subject line, in the copy or your email and the copy of all your ads. Mm. What I do is after you write a first draft, go back and circle all the verbs and then think, is that the best verb to use? If you find yourself using words like have and got and things like that a lot, you're writing really weakly. Go ahead and pepper the copy with words. Again, not words that people don't commonly use, but words that people understand like murder, humiliate, fascinate, you know, just words that carry a little bit of a punch. I've changed ads from losers to winners by changing one word in a headline. It is that powerful when you start doing that. Again, don't go over the head of your reader. Rather, engage them. Be that guy 
they want to read who they're going to get a kick out of. Even if they don't click on the link, even if they don't buy what you have, even if they read the email and then go do something else, that's okay because that's the first step. You want to get them used to reading it. So you do that by being the most interesting or non-boring or most intriguing email they've got in their inbox today. Mm. I've noticed uh, a really good way to understand this verb thing or even just how to use words in this way is to go and look at really high quality bullets because what mm-hmm. will happen is a beginning copywriter or an amateur will just say something bland like uh, you know, a special trick to I don't know, lose 10 pounds and right. a good copywriter will come in there and find like well, what can we do? They, they start adding one weird trick and that just steps yep. it up a little bit and then you might say like one weird, one ancient trick that Buddhist monks used two, two and a half thousand years ago. Every time you add a little bit more to that, it just turns up that curiosity notch a little bit more. Do this as long as you want. That's absolutely right, John. And that one weird trek started a whole industry. There are a dozen different guys using similar kinds of banner ads like that with uh, drawings, with cute little gifts. It's all based on the word weird. And they've tried to replace the word weird, like like you said, like ancient or one confusing you know, myth about losing weight or something like that. And it keeps coming back. Weird is a power word. And it's been used a long time in the tabloid magazines back when those were not online when you get them at the checkout stand in in the supermarket. So words like weird, words like frightening, words like gory, abusive, again, humiliate, things like that. So yes, strong words, power words is, is, is what I call them. And I went through in that report, which you get with almost everything you buy from me, just has all of those words and phrases just pulled out. And it's like a lot of people just use that before they sit down to write any copy. They sit down and go through a couple of the pages. I think it's 20 pages long, just of little words and phrases, just three or four columns on each page, just one after the other. Okay. And it just kind of makes your mind kind of start to think, oh, yeah, that's a different way to say that. Oh, yeah, that's a tweak to the normal, you know, hey, hey, here's a way to lose some weight, guys. And okay. how can you make that better? How can you make that intriguing? How can you make that part of the, the beginning of a long story that's going to be fascinating? Okay. This is perfect for subject lines too, if anyone's listening, that they can take oh, a, yes. when you when you hear a word like frightening or humiliating, like it conjures up very powerful images, which is you know why these are power words. So if you can work these into a subject line and add some sort of weird angle. This guy had an email about you know why the goat didn't die or something to do with a goat. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to read that and think, what the hell is he talking about? I have to yeah. read that. <laughs> yeah. This all is predicated on knowing something about your prospect, which is stage one of all good marketing. A lot of people think, you know, I'll write so well that it'll go to anybody. And that's, that's missing a very basic tool. It's yeah. like, get to know your audience. Absolutely. You know, you wouldn't date just anybody. I mean, you may think you would if you're desperate, but once you start becoming a savvy person in the world, it's like you start becoming a little more discriminatory and you understand your market. Yep. You start to understand the things that are going on in their head and how to approach them in a way that makes better sense, that makes sense to them or tweaks one of their hotspots and gets them curious. Like there are probably a number of people who aren't interested in goats and may be offended. If you went to say a goat herder, if he was on your list, he may he may not, not do that. But most people, you can find some way to tweak their interests. So get to know your audience, get to know what your prospects needs, fears, dreams, and especially what's keeping them up late at night. If you know that, you can write short, pithy subject lines that he will break a finger clicking on on the uh, on absolutely the... man how many points have we been through now i've got five written down but i think uh, we've been jumping around it's been great that was it i think oh I, I wanted to make sure that point about one job of the email that's that's a separate point no tangents with one of the big mistakes is people get confused especially when writing short bursts of conversational copy and that they go off on a tangent and you got to learn to strip that down get to the point read it out loud. Imagine your prospect sitting across from you and you're actually in a conversation and think about it. At what point would, would you be talking? Would he like blink a couple of times, get distracted and walk away or start listening to the music or go do something else? Then you've lost him. Don't lose him. Just make it a what we call a greased slide so that when he gets on at the first word of the subject line, and it used to be you could use his name. And now that's so common that in fact, when your name is used in a subject line, 
it's often a tip off that it's a marketer sending you something and you have, you know, it's whatever name you gave when you signed up for whatever list he, he, he got your name from. But that used to be a good way of doing it is, is starting with the name. In some markets, it may still be a way to do it. But from the very first word through the last plea to action, you'll click on this link now before your entire world collapses, you idiot, and then have the link, you know, some, something along that line. It should be a grease slide so that somebody gets on at the start and they just zoom to the bottom until they've actually clicked on the link. It's a breathless ride. They're not even sure why they clicked on the link, but there they are. They're clicking on the link. You've taken them out of that passive state of just browsing through their inbox and clicking and, and unsubscribing and doing stuff. So you've woken them up and put them on this ride that takes them into this highly conscious state where they want to find out more. They're interested. They're actually being proactive by, by clicking on the link and moving into whatever thing you've got on the link. And if it's a sales page, they are in a slightly heightened state because you can't put somebody to sleep and sell them. They have to be able to click on the order page. They got to haul their credit card out. They, they got to do whatever they need to do to finish the transaction. So your job is to intrigue them, titillate them and wake them up. Okay. So just, just real quick before we go on this, this content idea that you're sending them out, you might be a pitch, might be sending them to a podcast or a video or something that's going to help. But you really, it's like dating. You're just getting in there, getting into their inbox, getting them opening that email, getting them pumped up, kind of interested. Maybe they buy something, maybe they don't. But when they're ready to buy, you're going to be the first person they think of. So you can say anything in this email. It doesn't have to be about your product. You can just be interesting. And the payoff, of course, is knowing what your prospect, you know, what's in their head already. Uh, we talk about joining the conversation already Absolutely. in their head. But also tweaking the conversation already in their head to kind of wake them up, to go further than that, to Leading actually them. be that interesting guy who just wrote you an email and it's like, hey, that's John McIntyre. I can't believe you sent me an email. Boom, you click on it, see what's happening before they're thinking. They may yep. not even finish the subject line. <laughs> <laughs> Most marketers aren't in that situation. Most marketers, you know, you're hovering the cursor over the email and you're thinking, do I really want to get into this? You know, what's Joe got to say? I don't know. Last time it was boring and you've lost right yeah. there. So. Absolutely. All right, man. Well, I really appreciate you coming on to talk about this. Before we go, tell people where they can go to learn more about uh, John Carlton and all the stuff you're uh, selling. And, you know, you got tons of blog posts available. Yeah. On my blog, John Carlton, it's J O H N dash C A R L T O N dot com. I couldn't get John Carlton. It turns out there's dozens of John Carltons in the U.S. and some woodworker in Boston grabbed John <laughs> Carlton dot com before I did it. But the blog, uh, I started it in December of 2002. So we are. God, year 11? Oh, my God. And all the posts are free, and I've posted every month for all those years, always on marketing, writing, and, and good stuff about living life well. And on the right-hand column is about everything I have, everything from my coaching programs to the simple writing system, which is still being touted, even though it's two or three years old. I forget. It's still being touted as the best, you know, how to write step-by-step, -step, how to actually start writing the best copy of your life. So you can get involved in that. We just re-released it again. My book is up there. Everything you need to know. So get on there, sign up, so you'll get alerts about when I put new blog posts up. I, I post every month. That's the portal to my world is john-carlton.com. It's a, it's a blog, free archives, tailing way into the last decade. Just a lot of fun, a lot of good stuff, and a lot of ways to connect with other people. Fantastic, man. I've been on your site before. You've got some great content on there. So if people are listening, they should go check that out. And I'll have a link on the, the website, dropdeadcopy.com, in the show notes for this podcast that, uh, to make things easy. So uh, thanks for coming on, John. John, I hope it fulfilled your needs for this uh, podcast. So. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you want to discover more insider tips, tricks, and secrets about driving sales with email marketing, sign up for daily email tips from the autoresponder guy. Go to dropdeadcopy.com slash podcast, sign up, confirm your email address, and I'll send you daily emails on how to improve your email marketing and make more sales via email. You'll find out why open rates don't matter and the seven-letter word that underlies all effective marketing and much more. The 
The editing and production of this podcast were provided by Authority Engine. Learn more at authorityengine.com.